our next panel is data valence, surveillance and ubervalence. Before we begin our session today, we're going to go again because we're coming to you from another part of the world. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wadi Wadi people of the Dharawal country on which I present to you and pay my respects to elders past and present. My name is Katina Michael. I'm from the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University. It's my absolute pleasure to be hosting this event and to be one of the organizers of the American Association of Geographers Geoethics series of webinars. And here are the other co-organizers. I also acknowledge Professor Jeremy Pitt again for co-hosting and Dr. Roba Abbas from the University of Wollongong. Roger Clark, uh, over to you. You defined data valence in 1986 during what I believe was the height of the Australia card debate. And this is what you look like back in 1986. <laughs> so if you'd like to give your opening remarks with your presentation, Roger, over to you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Uh uh, in order to go forwards, we've got to go backwards. So uh, Katina's asked me to have a look at, uh, at the past. And this party balloons there because it's about 35 years this week that I did my first slides and the term data valence had its first public outing. I did the slides on cellulose um, using pen and possibly a dot matrix printer. <clears throat> my how times have changed. Now, of course, <clears throat> we're all highly familiar with the nature of surveillance with its origins. 1790s, 1810s, crossing the English Channel, um, and the multiple lives and resurgences that it's had. These, the concept from the beginning was very much a physical one, visual uh, and spatial. Um, and uh, that continued as other kinds of extensions to the idea arose. Uh, the oral um, sound only, the um, surveillance of people um, over distance, uh, the ability to record um, and play back and therefore do um, examinations of the past um, is still in the geospatial sphere. But even in the 1850s with the telegraph and certainly in the 1890s with the telephone, electronic space, a different kind of spatial uh, uh, was in vogue. So it's been important for us uh, throughout these analyses to make sure that the notion of surveillance uh, is a generic one. Of course, we're assuming that it's going to be systematic and we need to distinguish many kinds or subcategories and personal surveillance versus mass surveillance, of course, has its differences. Now, it was in that context in the early 80s as an information systems person that I asked the question about, but hold on a minute, aren't we missing something here? And what we were missing was that from the 60s onwards, information technology had been applied in order to, uh, in a systematic way, manage data. And quite a lot of that data from the very beginning uh, was about people. So uh, what it became obvious was that there was scope for uh, the observation of individuals, not through their physical selves, but through data that was recorded about them and the application of information technologies of various kinds uh, to exploit that data. Um, so that was the birth uh, of, the, of the idea. And the importance of the idea was that uh, was simply economics. Uh, it's far less expensive to monitor far more people. And therefore, it's a combination of mass as well as personal surveillance, because you can detect individuals who should attract your attention. So you single people out from the mass. And of course, always hanging out in the background was that although surveillance is about observation um, or active watching, the intention is to influence behavior and even to control behavior. Now, over the years, it's been necessary to, to delve down into a whole series of areas um, that support uh, data valence approaches. Uh, this is a, a long standing diagram that tries to tease out the issue of what is it that people are watching. Um, the center of the diagram looks at the mainstream of identities. People talk about identity management and identifier. Um, what they often overlook is the fact that on the left-hand side of that diagram, there's the concept of what I call an identifier, 
which is a, a, a means of, uh, in the abstract world, storing data and associating it with a real world entity. Um, biometrics cuts through the many, many identities that we have and that we present to different organizations and the many uh, different record systems that have us as relatively independent beings it consolidates them into a single view and denies us uh, those multiple perspectives. That's been a very important element of the development of data valence. The digital persona, um, I've relied here on the original 1992 diagram, uh, but it still says the things that need to be said. The mode that we moved to way back then was that we are looking much less over time at the individual in an organization. Sorry, the organization is looking much less at the individual themselves in the physical world. And they're looking much more at the abstracted um, model of the individual that's been built from the transactions. Um, and that's being used as a proxy in our decision making. Uh, and of course, the hard edges of the of the diagram down at the bottom versus the soft edges of the of the human in the real world are where we're at. Um, over time, an accretion of data um, has taken place, and these days, quite a lot of data is collected specifically for the purposes of data valence rather than for the purposes of conducting transactions with individuals. Uh, the location and tracking aspect is the one that needs highlighting only partly because this is a geo event uh, but also because of the, of the criticality of it uh, this shifted um, uh, very significantly the intensiveness um, of the observation of individuals and there are many uh, many facets of this that could be dwelt on in day-long seminars where this has led us to, of course, is that from digitization, organizations saw the scope to do more. And digitalization is the term that some people have been using for this. Um, so we have now moved to a stage where interactions are generally with digital personae rather than with people, which frees organizations of some of the obligations uh, to take into account things like tolerance. Their individual staff members don't get to deal one-to-one -one with many of the customers. Therefore, the customers are their identities or their digital persona, not human beings. And that reduces costs, makes things much simpler. The last bullet there is something that has been um, missed by an awful lot of people. I didn't used to talk about the dimension of privacy of personal experience, but for the last decade I've had to because uh, we used to be dealing or gathering our data as individuals, having our experiences in the analog world um, of reading um, physical copy, of borrowing from libraries, of reading newspapers, of watching uh, live events, and they were anonymous or mostly anonymous. Uh, these days, we completely flipped since the turn of the century. It's so 20th century to read old analog things. We are mostly identified when we are experiencing things. That dramatically changes the scope for influence. Of course, the big game in recent years has been the digital surveillance economy, which is the more grounded version of what um, uh, Zuboff uh, refers to um, as, as uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, you'll see from the left-hand side, the consolidation of data into the digital persona at the center of the document leads to a whole pile of capabilities out to the right-hand side. Uh, behavior manipulation, well, ad targeting, we're well aware of behavior manipulation, the population's a bit less aware of, and micropricing, amazingly, is still flying under the radar. Now, that's the flow of data valence through into the present. Um, of course, it's all been mostly bad news, despite the balloons. I'm hoping that um, what we can do is move across to some uh, some positive moves about the future, and I'm hoping that Steve is going to be a little bit more positive in his outlook than I've been. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Roger, for those opening comments. And of course, you know, you could do this a thousand times. I missed the critical slide here introducing our panelists. We had a bit of a pre-event briefing, and I think I got overly excited there. But Roger Clark, father of data valence, uh, Steve Mann, father of surveillance and of wearable computing, and MG Michael, he who coined Ubervalence. And the panel is specifically on what Jeremy said. Uh, as he opened the introduction, location technologies and services, geosurveillance and social justice. It's a privilege. This is, these are three seminal voices we never thought we'd hear under the same roof. And I think we've got Zoom to thank for that because I know Roger wouldn't have made it to the States and possibly difficult for Steve to travel to Australia, although he'd always hoped to meet me at Wollongong Uni. And for MG Michael, thank you. So data valence, 
surveillance and ubervalence. And here is an early photo of uh, Professor Steve Mann in the 1980s. I've gone back to the, our three speakers to see what they were all doing. So we saw Roger Clark with Australia Card, and here was Steve. I mean, Steve. You look like a, a superhero, mm. but I think you've got a wearable on. And so over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you for your participation. Yeah, so uh, my name is Steve Mann. I'm, I'm at my home lab. I live here at home with my wife and two children upstairs and downstairs is my research lab. I sort of uh, build things and have some fun. This is my uh, front space. I've got the underwater pipe organ. The underwater musical instrument is over there. It plays uh, sound and And uh, so this is, I, I kind of grew up in this, in this world in my childhood. I used to like to pick up signals and look at things. I modified television screens to become oscillographs to plot functions. And uh, in my childhood, my father got me this cathode ray oscillograph. It was broken at the time, it was not working. Someone was throwing it away because it was older technology. But I had fun fixing it, getting it going. But before I, I, I fixed it, I made some interesting discoveries. I had it plugged into a police radar set, this this one right here. And uh, what I noticed is when I moved it, uh, it would cause a Doppler shift. The, the, the time base wasn't working on it. The dot only went up and down. So I started moving it back and forth to try to see functions. And by accident, it its Doppler shift affected the radar. And so I discovered this concept of, of uh, metavalence, the sensing of sensing. Police radar are watching us, but now we can see these otherwise invisible radar signals. So seeing otherwise invisible radio waves like this uh, smartphone here. This is a replica of my childhood invention called the sequential wave and printing machine. It allows us to see these electromagnetic radio waves. And so this device, a SWIM, sequential wave and printing machine, um, is a is a device that allows us to see and photograph and understand electromagnetic waves. So that was kind of one of my childhood inventions. Uh, this was uh, a computer from 1978. I bought that Apple computer. Um, and this is some of the other technology. This is the best amplifier ever built in human history. It was made in 1961. Nobody's ever built a better amplifier since then. Um, and so there's a certain, uh, interest in how things work. And I've always been fascinated by how things work, design of things. And so uh, what uh, Jeremy Pitt said really struck home to heart, you know, data ownership, and in fact, ownership of scientific fact, you know, secrecy of design and, and how things are, how designs are often kept in secret, and, and we're not able to understand how things work, or there's a, there's a tendency to to not be able to understand how things work. And so uh, what I, 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 I talk about is surveillance systems, systems that render their inner workings observable to the end user. This uh, computer that I bought in 1978 had uh, in it a schematic diagram that listed how it worked. It had source code listings for it. It was completely open to being able to under, be understood clearly. Nothing in it was hidden. And likewise, many of these objects here, this tape recorder here, all of these objects from my childhood uh, were open and easy to understand. And surveillance is, is a good word to describe them as, a, as an adjective. Uh, the word surveillance has entered into the Oxford English Dictionary now as the recording of an activity by a participant in the activity using personal devices, wearable cameras and so on. And so my daughter sort of summed it up in this nice little drawing. You know, she draws it. What is the difference between surveillance and surveillance? So surveillance is oversight and surveillance is undersight. And so surveillance systems are systems that lay bare their inner workings and become comprehensible to the end user. And that's kind of the, the idea. I think that's the core concept that, that we want to, to think about. So, uh, you know, even these concepts that, that Jeremy talked about, you know, privacy and attention. I, I like to think of privacy as protecting that which, uh, on the outgoing side, that's which privacy, which is violated by microphones and cameras and, and attention is, uh, you know, violated by, you know, solitude is that which is violated by loudspeakers and, 
television displays that are annoying. And if we separate those concepts out, inward bound and outward bound information, I think it's useful and interesting to understand. But anyway, uh, you know, we have surveillance oversight and we've got surveillance undersight. And then we've got privacy over here. And I think it makes sense to think about, you know, the right at the intersection of these three, we have privalence and the interplay between privacy and surveillance and surveillance. To me, that's what's really interesting. Privacy isn't really the thing. In a way, privacy is just another form of surveillance. I've seen this, uh, I saw this uh, situation where there were um, the the owner of a facility put in some surveillance cameras in the in the change rooms and shower areas uh, to try to make sure people weren't stealing or whatever. And the privacy commissioner said that that was okay as long as only the police can see the data. So this is privacy is another panopticon in that sense. So what is privacy really? Well, we really got to rethink that question. If privacy is just surveillance, we need something different. We need to think about privalence as an interplay. So. We formed the uh, McLuhan Group, the Marshall McLuhan Working Group on Privalence. Privalence.com is this uh, look at these intersection. Privalence.com is this uh, kind of look at the interplay between privacy and surveillance and surveillance. And so you can look at this in terms of of systems, if we look at it in a broader sense of data ownership and data, uh, you know, who owns the data and all of these concepts, if we if we think of it, if we think of surveillance systems, which is something we wrote about, surveillance systems are systems that are understandable by their end users. And so that's that's kind of what we what, what we want to discuss is how do we how can we build a system architecture that makes the system understandable? So it's not just about observable AI or explainable AI or understandable AI. It's asking the question of observable or explainable by who? And so is it observable and explainable by the end user? And if so, then that's surveillance systems. And such systems that are explainable AI that's explainable by the end user and not just by the manufacturer is AI that is what we call humanistic intelligence or HI, humanistic intelligence. And this is what we call surveillant AI. And so uh, back in uh, many years ago, we did this special issue in the IEEE intelligence systems uh, called wearable AI. And what wearable AI is, is a surveillance system. It's, a, it's wearable AI is surveillance, surveillance systems. And that's kind of at the heart of it. When you start to wear these technologies, they become part of your body. They become part of your mind and body is a natural extension of the mind and body. Much of my childhood, I explored building these systems. These are some of the artifacts from my childhood that were on exhibit at the Smithsonian Institute and the National Gallery and other places like that. To showing this is kind of as I was growing up, I experimented with this notion of putting these cathode ray screens into eyeglasses. This is from the 1970s, 1980s, uh, early 1980s. And so the idea is that it's an eyeglass system that captures information about you and what's happening around you. And so taking these, this kind of technology in the cathode ray tubes and making it smaller, smaller, small enough to build into eyeglasses. And so the result was this collection of these these eyeglasses. So this is this is one that I built in 1998. Uh, looks kind of like normal eyeglasses, not too far off, looking like normal eyeglasses. There's a resolution test chart from it. And so the idea that I envisioned is that we'd own our own data that's collected locally uh, are about us, and that which can be known about us, our personal health record. Um, what I called, you know, quanta, quantographic self-sensing. And that is uh, sensing of the self using these devices. And if we think of this, if we have this sort of notion of, of inward and outward, we can look at this as valence, as valence flux, 
uh, what's happening around us and what's happening inside us. So mind and body. So for example, the blueberry eyeglass technology that we developed is this notion of mind and world sensing eyeglass that senses what's happening inside our body, mind and body and what's happening around us. If we start with the mind as the, the seed of, of attention, you know, if you start with your, your brain and then around your brain, you've got the body and then around the body, there's clothes and then around the clothes, there's a car. A car is just loose fitting clothes. So a car is a form of wearable computing. It's just a little looser fitting and then buildings and streets and cities and so on. If you start with mental health first, and then you go to physical health and then you go to social health, which is interaction with other people. And then you go to, you know, uh, community health. And then finally you go to environmental health, that which is around us. It's very important to consider both the environment and the environment. The environment is that which is inside and the environment is that which is around us. The environment is, is that which happens around us and the environment is that which happens inside us, inside our bodies. You can think of a social bubble, if you will. And I would even draw this as a dotted line because I think the clothes, the clothing is part of the environment. I would say clothes is part of the environment. There's a very famous old saying, a joke sort of, it goes something like, now beam up my clothes, Scotty, that wasn't very funny. And so there's a deep understanding there of what is part of us, technology that is part of us, technology that becomes us. If we were to jump into a time machine or a space machine and go somewhere else in space or time, we'd sort of, in science fiction, at least we'd expect our clothes to come with us, but maybe not necessarily this table that I'm sitting on or this bench or the table. But so that idea of what is it that's part of us, where's the boundary between us and what's around us? And that's very implicit to this notion of surveillance, surveillance, environment and environment. So environmentalism is, is, is akin to surveillance and environmentalism is akin to surveillance. And One so there's minute, these- please. Thank you, my friend. One minute. Great, perfect. So there's these parallels. There's this, this, uh, this, um, I can kind of draw it out in, 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 in really, in really a, a summary. There's AI and HI, and there's surveillance and surveillance, and there's the environment and the environment, and then there is security, and then there's a new concept that we call sweet security which is self-care. By the way, the word security is a Latin word meaning se meaning without and curity means care. So the closest direct English translation to the word security is the word carelessness. And so if we're gonna have some fun with the word security is carelessness and sweet curity is self-care. I was originally gonna say, well, we should have the opposite of security would just be curity, you know, just care without, without the carelessness. But I think really what we mean is sweet curity, which is self-care. And by that, we mean we look, we're looking after ourselves. So for every one of these forces, there's an equal and opposite force that needs to balance it. I'm not against or for surveillance. I'm just only saying that we need balance between the valences. So we live in a world that is multivalent and we can think of this world as a plurality of valences, surveillance, surveillance, and of course, metavalence, which is the valence of valence. Metavalence is sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. So we have all of these different valences and we must really carefully think about them. Privalence in particular and the interplay between surveillance and surveillance and privacy, uh, the kind of notion of seeing and not seeing. You know, how Thank much. you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. We could listen to you forever. Um, I love the counterbalance and balances. I think Christine Praxis on explanatory after the panel session, we'll have so much to share on exactly what you were talking about in terms of self-care and beyond. Steve, I'm going to move on just in the consciousness of time. Um, we're indebted to you for showing us your personal living mm -hmm. space and for being mm -hmm. so, so clear. Mm -hmm. um, the next speaker is MG Michael. Um, Michael, you're a historian and theologian who somehow found themselves in the field of bioethics and security. This was you around about 1983, 84, I think, uh, as a police officer, and I take no credit for that. 
Um, but can you tell us a little bit about ubervalence today? Well, um, just before I begin, uh, I just want to say um, hello to all my wonderful old friends and to all my new friends. Um, I'm very happy to be with you and I feel privileged. And just before I define the violence, just um, another point I want to make is speaking after Jeremy and, and Roger and Steve, I, I have to say, I feel like a small fish swimming between three great whales. So <laughs> I, I, I feel quite overwhelmed. So I'll do my best. So um, here I go. Um, Uber Valence, as cited in the Macquarie Dictionary, is an omnipresent electronic surveillance facilitated by technology that makes it possible to embed surveillance devices in the human body. I coined the term in a classroom at the University of Wollongong um, in early 2006 in response to a student question who asked me where I thought all this pervasive surveillance was heading. And um, given my, my study of surveillance and, and having taught data balance, Roger's work in my classrooms, um, Uber balance just came into my mind for reasons that I really can't get into here, but there's a whole history behind the concept of the term which I've written about. So in the Australian Law Dictionary, the entry states, ubiquitous or pervasive electronic surveillance that is not only always on, but always with you, ultimately in the form of bodily invasive surveillance. Now, why these definitions please me is because they've been literally taken word for word from our papers, which is fantastic to keep the integrity of the um, history of transmission of the work. At the conclusion, I'll read you the original definition. And there's one word in there that I, I'm very grateful that's not there at the moment, because that might have changed the impetus of, of, of the definition. And for that, I'm grateful to Katina. And I'll get to that at the conclusion of um, the presentation. So in 2007, we held our second national security workshop, which was again funded by the Australian Research Council. Roger keynoted for us on the theme, data valence to, uh, data valence to Uber valence and the realpolitik of the transparent society. Five participants on today's speaker list, 15 years on, were also there contributing their understanding and knowledge to our discipline. Katina and I began to publish on ubervalence from as early as 2006. One of our first papers was presented by one of our colleagues in New York. But uh, not long afterwards, we were invited to present at the 29th International Conference on Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners in Montreal, Canada. I presented my paper on, on, on that panel alongside David Lyon of Queen's University. The contemporary idea of ubervalence is related to objects that can be placed inside the human body and to provide precise information about movements and locations. The body in effect becomes a node in the internet of things. A class, a good example of, of the reach of ubervalence is a class of these types of devices are called technotherapeutics, and they can be used in healthcare to provide doctors and, other, and others with critical information about the human body on a 24 times seven spectrum. The idea of ubervalence raises a variety of questions on epic themes such as privacy, which as, as, as we have seen is now um, is at the time where we need to reconsider its concept and definition, as Steve said. Um, it also raises the questions of control versus convenience, ethics, and human rights. Those looking closely at technotherapeutics and other similar devices might describe ubervalence as surveillance from the inside looking out where these devices may be thought of as black box technologies for the human body. In effect, similar to the black boxes that are placed in an aircraft. The idea is that these devices may effectively force individuals, um, either coerced or by default, 
to provide detailed information on their movements to outside observers, whether machine or human, regardless of whether these are related to government groups or not. And that emerging uses of such implantable technologies may lead to various instances of abusive or dangerous ubervalence in the future, which of course leads to the question of the neutrality of technologies, but that's another issue. Recently, um, I was fascinated to find ubervalence referenced in the bibliography of a white paper from the Department of Defense Joint Chief of Staff and the Department of Homeland Security. It was also cited at the, and the topic of that white paper was on the horizon, security challenges at the nexus of state and non-state actors, emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, equally, Ubervalence was cited at the Q Symposium in Sydney in 2014 as one of the major threats of our times alongside pandemics, terrorism, and climate change. And now there are paintings in Europe, and this is just an example of, of similar type patents um, for an IoT human microchip implant with data. This patent reads, Vichip is a passive, passive microchip implant for humans with the distance reading possibility and data connectivity that enables the body to be a hub to the internet of things. We have developed and designed a glass encapsulated RFID microchip for implantation in the human body. The chip is designed to remain permanently, permanently embedded under the skin. Might these be marked as implantable Fitbit diagnostic devices? Would they even require FDA approval if they serve more than one purpose? Is this the beginning of scope creep or function creep? Financial, insurance, entertainment, transportation, and other services facilitated by a unique lifetime identifier. We've been talking about it for decades, me and Katrina and many of us here, but it is not a stretch of the imagination to envisage, envisage it today, given COVID-19. Mass surveillance versus urbavalence. Of course, when I'm in reference to COVID-19, I'm in the context of, of tracking and locating technologies and more so recently with vaccination passports. So mass surveillance versus urbavalence. Urbavalence takes that which was static or discrete in the data balance world and makes it constant and embedded. Consider it not only automatic and to do with identification, but also about location. That is the ability to automatically both locate and identify. In essence, the ability to perform automatic location identification, ALI. It has to do with the fundamental who, ID, Location, where, when, time. Quick, the where time questions in an attempt to derive, it's important to derive potentially the why, the motivation, the what, the result, and even the how, which is the method, the plan, and the thought. Uber valence can be a predictive mechanism for one's expected behavior, traits, or characteristics, likes or dislikes, or it can be based on historical fact or beyond or between. Omnipresence, omniscience, these don't always equate in the real world, maybe in the divine world, but not in the real world. So in our digital definition we wrote, or the original definition we wrote, ubervalence is an above and beyond, an exaggerated and almost omnipresent 24 seven electronic surveillance. It is a surveillance that is not only always on, but always with you, it is ubiquitous because the technology that facilitates it in its ultimate implementation is embedded within the human body. The problem of this kind of bodily invasive surveillance is that omnipresence in the material world will not always equate with omniscience. Hence the real concern, and this is a key concept in our work, the real concern for misinformation, misinterpretation and information manipulation. In other words, as one of our friends, Marcus Wigan as well said, 
context is all. So when context is lacking, you can have all the data in the world and it can mean absolutely nothing. In fact, they can lead to false estimations and great lies. Um, just before I move on to my last slide, so in the original definition, we had a word in there. It was an almost omnipresent. Now, Katina, to her credit, um, argued with me for a long time that the word almost should be removed. And she was right because she saw it in terms of, she saw it in terms of a meta narrative. So she was correct. I saw it more as something that was um, more localized, but Katuna was right. So removing the word almost made a heck of a difference. And I'm glad we did that. So ultimately there is an axis of axis. Now I would have liked to have remembered um, Steve's subtle correction here some time ago, but I don't. So Steve might correct us later um, and how I used axis here, but axis of axis, shows that the, the real issues are perhaps who owns these location movements in the form of data? Who has access to the data and by whose authority? For how long is it stored and how will it be used? So we have data access rights and stakeholder type. And the higher up the axis you go, the more entry you have into the, the uh, various technologies and the more uh, back doors you can enter into. So I think um, I've taken enough time. Uh, I think I'll finish here and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Roger. Um, we had prepared nine questions in total, which we're not going to get to, but perhaps I could put them in the Q&A uh, as we're going through in chat. But I wanted to summate. We've talked about surveillance. We've talked about the infrastructure that allows that surveillance to occur through networks particularly broadband and wireless networks. Uh, I would like to point to the wearables, both for surveillance and surveillance, uh, that which is 360 degrees, rotatable. Increasingly, as you can see here, implantables in hands, in triceps, in forearms, in legs, in ways to enable movement for safety as well, and for those <coughs> means for automation. Um, the tethering these new operational scenarios, the tethering that will occur between your wearables, as Steve has already uh, denoted and pointed to, but also the tethering between the hubs internal to the body uh, and these external devices, uh, whether they're lampposts, surveillance mechanisms, laptops, uh, pacemakers, or what have you. We're going to see a panoply of relationships here. I'm sorry, Roger Clark, uh, you were... I think uh, you were stolen of two minutes there. I would have liked to hear you further, but let's just keep the theme going today as we close this panel, data valence, surveillance, ubervalence, juxtaposing these three concepts throughout the day. And our next speaker, Professor Christine Paraxlis, who's an adjunct at Johnson and Wales University and also imminently at Arizona State University and a consultant, will now present her plenary session to all of us. I've known Christine since about 2004 or three. Uh, the late Robert Walk and Christine were responsible for writing one of the first papers on national security and different forms of identification, alluding to the potential for ubervalence before the term was even coined. So over to you, Christine, as I stop sharing. And thank you to Roger, Steve and Michael. Or of one another. New. I just, I just sent out a, a, a circles diagram. To, you know the, the concentric circles. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that's missing from that model is the possibility of having an implantable technology that's controlled and owned and operated by the individual, which I'll call untervalence. So untervalence is to ubervalence as surveillance is to surveillance, and I've proposed that as maybe being at the center of the circles if we're thinking of it concentrically. Thank you, Steve. Jeremy, you, you've spoken uh, along the lines of an open democracy and open data systems and open systems as opposed to privatized social media systems, for example. Could you comment or re respond to that? Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, uh, uh, 
in the sense that I mean I was very taken actually I may I haven't seen it before but um, uh, the, the notion of the environment and the environment against privacy and attention uh, there, there seems to be like a quadrant that one could um, draw up there uh, and and look into into this uh, in terms of what that is actually doing with uh, um, information going in, information going out, and where the decision-making about those things actually takes place. Uh, as Steve quite clearly said, the, the boundaries are not actually uh, fixed, uh, and they are, they are permeable, and this is what makes it a bit, of a bit of a moving target. And so this is one of the reasons why you know, it has to be a kind of subjective thing, um, which... You, you, you collect and aggregate in some way in order for you know, groups to be have the power over what decisions are being made. And this is the democratization. And that's something that's really being you know, uh, a right that's being taken away from us, in my opinion. Roger Clark, I'd like you to comment, please, on several things. But go ahead. I think you were going to say something in response to Jeremy. Actually, I was going to pursue a, an, another line of something Go ahead. different. That's okay. Uh, there was one thing I agonised about having to leave out of my of my slide set because I couldn't think how to fit it into five to six minutes, uh, and that was the question about um, uh, data analytics, big data, AI, ML. Mm. How does that play into the data valence and other valence games? And, the, and since that hasn't arisen this morning so far, I might just quickly feed it in. A couple of quick points being, of course, that it uh, the big data idea and the open data uh, mantra mm -hmm. leads to an awful lot more data uh, available to people to scrunch. Um, and the second is uh, that the inferences drawn from uh, big data using these techniques, although it begins by being about populations, it narrows down to individuals and categorizes a great deal. So we've got another, another feedback loop going in there. And one of the biggest concerns to me in a lot of the work I've been doing recently um, has been about the extent to which inferencing is low grade as a result of all of this data, uh, the presumption that uh, lots more data means means you don't have to worry about bad data anymore. That, that nonsense that's been perpetrated in the data and analytics sphere really has to be contested. Um, but it's, um, it's reaching a point where uh, we have got the unobservability um, of, um, of rationale. And once we've reached this point of a rational decision making based on inferencing techniques which have drawn on big data, which is feeding back around to influence individuals. That's another element that we've got to factor into somewhere into the data balance and valence space. And I haven't quite worked out where to put it yet. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. I, I'm going to ask the last question of the morning to Michael. I'm going to be a bit biased here. Uh, I'm going to ask him, why do you engage in the work that you do and the research that you do? Uh, it's a very important question for me, given my background is, is, is in theology, but um, well, first of all, let me say, let me say my fear for river valence is that river valence, when it's full blown, it doesn't allow for second chances. Um, river valence, full blown, has no compassion. River valence, full, blo full fully blown, doesn't understand repentance. So this is what mm. I'm fighting against, a full-blown liberal balance. And I think yeah. even in secular terms, Roger used a, perhaps a more acceptable word, severe surveillance doesn't allow for tolerance. So there's um, something that George Eliot said, any coward can fight a battle when he or they are sure of winning. So I don't know whether we're going to win this battle. I, I don't know, but we also fight against time, knowing that one day we all are going to die and yet we live. So it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I think, nor does it matter what I believe will happen. What matters is what I must do, knowing what I know. So that's why I do it. I, I, I want to share my own little aspect of what this great puzzle means. So um, yes, because why do we write literature? We ask this question of authors, we have to, we need to. So because I think I have to. So with those comments, Christine Paraxelis, what a talk you gave us today. I cannot underscore it. Mm. Roger Clark, 
Steve, man, you honoured us, mm -hmm. uh, both of you. We look to you mm. so much in your research. We've yes. cited your work so extensively, mm -hmm. but you've really put this on the table for geo surveillance and social justice and the location technologies, that infrastructure that's enabling this. And I think we came out with a few takeaways that we'll put into some fact sheet post this conference. But Jeremy Pitt, thank you for setting the tone this morning mm -hmm. to everybody that's been uh, writing in the chat. We started with 43 people. We have 42 because one person is not using a dual device. Uh, and it just shows me we're going to stay with one another to the end of the morning session uh, for those who can, especially if time allows. What we're going to do next, because now we have, we're breaking out into three rooms where we're going to get even more intimate in those three breakout sessions. Breakout room one is moderated by the wonderful Teresa Anderson, whom I adore, of Connecting Stones. She'll be moderating two sessions, one with Reese Farthing on youth and location technologies, and another on gender violence and location technologies with Toby Shurov. In track two, we have Matthew Mitka, who will be moderating both Jason Sargent on humanitarian topics and geolocation, and thereafter, Dr. Robert Abbas uh, from the University of Wollongong on transdisciplinarity the social, the ethical, the regulatory with respect to location services and geosurveillance. And in the final track, track three, is the wonderful Nicole Stevenson from Ground Up Consulting, who will be looking and moderating Elma uh, Heyrich uh, from Arizona State University, who will be looking at blue poles and uh, location services and data rights, and also followed by Rob Nichols on biometrics regulation uh, do as I see or something like that. It's going to be awesome. So number one, think about youth and women. Track two, more about humanitarian and transdisciplinarity and as approaches. And track three, as more data regulation and so forth. Now, deep dive into any one of these three tracks, assign yourselves rooms and have a ball. Thank you so much, everyone. Are you on me? Hello? <laughs> Jeremy there? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to go to a breakout room. Oh, yeah. Jeremy, it was super awesome what you said about the quadrants. I'm thinking environment, environment, quadrants, ubervalence, untervalence, oh, you've, surveillance, you've done surveillance. Brilliant. <laughs> Look at that. So we yeah, could almost yeah. say, if I if we put a quadrant, like if we made a quadrant environment at the top and then environment uh, at the top bar, and then inside those quadrants, four things, ubervalence, untervalence under the environment, mm -hmm. and under environment, surveillance and surveillance. It almost makes a perfect set of quadrant. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Because there's a missing element. Untervalence is the missing yes. part of the quadrant. Yeah. You know, unter in German is the opposite. Oh, yes, it means yes, under. Yes. yes. So, so it might it might fit nicely as a set of quadrants to say, okay, this thing's being implanted, but who controls it? Is it like in prisoners? You know mm -hmm. how these things are implanted to track prisoners versus uh, something that is implanted by your own choice that you control. Certainly, yes. Uh, and then uh, somebody put a, a comment about um, to something you said about the the curity, which I really liked. Yeah. And the plurality of valences, but the um, uh, a reference to Foucault uh, and care of the self. Um, oh yes, yeah. Uh, but there's something also about the, obviously Foucault and uh, his um, power knowledge thing. So, so one of the things to in within those quadrants is to work out you know where the knowledge is, and so you, know, you follow the knowledge, you find out where the power is, and that was one of the things I was really concerned about, obviously, in my, my opening remarks about uh, the, the, the disconnect of power, the, or the asymmetry of power. Yes, there's a lot of uh, information asymmetry is what people often mm -hmm. talk. Right, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, information asymmetry is a common term, although we don't know, like there's knowledge, wisdom, information, data, mm -hmm. you know, this hierarchy or whatever. So what, I don't know what level of the hierarchy it's at, but the asymmetry of it, what you talked about at the beginning, 
data I found really fascinating when you first talked about data ownership and symmetry, because I think there's something to be worked at in there is is uh, the asymmetry of the situation. Absolutely. Yes. Um, yes. Let's